Can you pass the potatoes, please? You asked me. With your arm lazily held across the table, waiting to get what you want, I'm surprised at your manners. Because you've never asked before. You always got what you want. And then you sit here. With the audacity to pray with those that you have prayed upon, have you any shame? Have you considered the consequences of your actions, the scars that your manhood pierced into the untouched flesh of my skin, but yet you sit here with the nerve to look me in my eye and ask me anything at all? Maybe you think I forgot. Maybe you think I actually wanted it. Maybe you think consent was reserved for adults, so maybe you just thought that you would decide for me because obviously I was never old enough. But you quickly determined that the price of my innocence was your satisfaction, and you paid it under the table, quietly convincing me that it was okay and that secrets are fun to keep, reminding me that my mother would be angry or people wouldn't really believe me or my favorites. I told you to stop walking around the house in them shorts, in this house. The same house in which I had memories of growing and maturing, afraid of my womanhood and how it would entice you, afraid to see it as beauty, but instead taught to see it as a symbol of sexuality and misguided love. It is around these same people that you would wrap your arms around me without permission and discuss the very intimate moments of my life where I tried to forget about you in this house. Where my tears fed the garden that I worked so hard to regrow and that my innocent body should be covered so to not test your self-control, you would come to my graduations and my birthdays and blemish the day simply by your presence. Because you still had the nerve to look me in my eye and remain in my life after you know what happened. After you know that you were the thief in my night, stealing moments and memories, stealing discoveries about my body and beauty and sensations that I should always willingly give away. You tainted the word pleasure and introduced the true meaning of the word pain, the two of which create a barrier that protects the innermost parts of me, a barrier that should only be broken when I give permission. That blood is precious and it was mine, a rite of passage that only I should initiate, but yet you stole it and still call me your family. You hug my brothers and sisters with the same arms that swam recklessly in my sea of immaturity. You greet those with my blood, with my blood on your hands. You kiss them with the same lips that convince me of normalcy. Your betrayal haunts me. And maybe life really has been unkind to you, but listen clearly, I am not a coping mechanism. And that is not an excuse. And I don't know how it is that you feel okay within your soul to sit across from me at dinner or wish me a happy birthday or tell my mother how much I have grown as if you haven't stolen enough memories with the memory of what you stole from me. So since you're still here, since you didn't have the decency to leave and since you were right, they really didn't believe me because I was too young to understand. Oh, how suddenly my age became your defense and my innocence your alibi. And you stuck around to remind me. I have some things I want to ask you. Can you ever admit it? Can you ever admit that I actually did have a reason to be angry? Can you ever admit that you are what happened when I suddenly changed. Can you ever admit that I changed because I felt betrayed and confused and silenced? Can you ever admit that I changed because I was forced to grow into the woman that would comfort the little girl that I was supposed to be? The little girl that somehow felt protected by the silence, but today that little girl speaks her truth. Can you refine the decency to apologize to my bruised but relentless spirits? Can you look into the same eyes that shed remnants of my soul every time you touched me? Can you ever own up to your own destructive nature and realize that you could never truly destroy me? But you do. Owe me a motherfucking apology. Because I 
why? Because I am in control of my own damn body. And then when you apologize, can you be humane enough to remove yourself from my life as a statue of limitations will never vindicate you. And my family's fear of shame does not equate to your approval. I speak for myself when I say that your time is up. And I speak with my sisters and my brothers when we say that your time is up. Can you hear the clock ticking? And can you hear me clearly when I say, no, I will not pass shit for you. And don't you make me tell you again. Thank you. On September 17, 2017, in Los Angeles, California, a phrase was said that rang throughout the sound waves of every cell phone, tablet, and computer across the world. It was on this day that my idol, Issa Rae, <laughs> when approached with the question, who are you rooting for at that year's Emmy Awards, proceeded to answer as such, and I quote, I'm rooting for everybody black. <laughs> I really am, end quote. Well, it was in this moment that I felt transported to my youth, the very first time that I truly recognized my blackness, this scarlet letter burned into my flesh, as if melanin was a poison that I had no choice but to drink, and the sins of the world saturated my skin because I damn sure didn't ask to be black. But yet, here I am, a little girl looking into the world, hoping to find a reflection of herself only, to be met with a glass ceiling on which I saw the soles of the feet of people dancing upon my dreams, dressed in the latest privilege, a brand that many refuse to admit they inherently own. But when black children are suspended because their hair is considered a distraction, the standard is quite clear. And when black-sounding names are met with more suspicion and less distinction than their white counterparts, the standard is quite clear. Our very existence is questioned. We can't have the hair on our own heads, the fullness of our lips, or the thickness of our hips. Well, not really mine, y'all. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but then again, it becomes a fashion trend when it's inappropriately appropriated. Selling melanin $30 for an hour session or $500 for lip injections. Meanwhile, all our lives we had to fight for this, to simply be okay, for my right to simply take up space without being of service to you, of entertainment to you, or being considered a threat. Listen. I'm rooting for everybody black because I remember that Hattie McDaniel, the very first African-American to win an Oscar, was let into the all-white award ceremony only as a favor. I'm rooting for everybody black because I remember that the 44th president of these United States, Mr. Barack Obama, was still only seen by many as a nigger. I'm rooting for everybody black because I resent the allegation that affirmative action is the root cause of my success when it is simply there to assure that my magic is acknowledged, my magic, that dynasties before me have poured into my eloquence because as a black woman, speaking black has become something that I do with pride because some of the earliest of languages were birthed in the land from which my ancestors were stolen. So my vocabulary and my intelligence in no way deny my blackness, and my occasional to frequent use of ebonics in no way denies my intelligence. So listen, I'm rooting for everybody black because I'm sure that eight of the Little Rock Nine that are still alive today would be happy to educate you on why we so resiliently created a language of our own as a proper education was always reserved for those that didn't look like me. So I'm rooting for everybody black because as we infiltrate the spaces that used to be deemed white only, I am telling you that you have always deserved to be there. You can compete with any damn body. So I'm rooting for you to show up. I'm rooting for you to break every glass ceiling and challenge every opposition because when the next generation of little boys and little girls realize that they are black, I want them to realize it with pride, dignity, and hope for their future. Their life does not have to be a trap. I want them to wear this skin, this scarlet letter like a badge of honor. Because listen, black people, we do miracles. We walk on water, held up by the sea of beautiful black bodies.
bodies that came before us, we raise the dead because living within us is the strength and resilience of our ancestors. So to find yourself, you are not the stereotype of your quote unquote hip hop culture. You are not a monolith. You are every color of the black rainbow, every tint and every hue as you deserve to be your own. Not a burden to your race to explain away your individuality, but you are beautiful and unique. And I am rooting for you. I'm rooting for you because you are smart, you is kind, and you is important. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. I'm rooting for you because you are elegant and divine. I'm rooting for you because you are soulful and brilliant. You are loud and boisterous. You are meek and socially awkward. You are creative and you are unparalleled. I'm rooting for you because black bodies like ours are still being sold as chattel today. So I'm rooting for you to emancipate yourself from mental slavery so that we can remove those chains. I am rooting for you. The next Martin Luther King, the next Maya Angelou, the next Lauren Hill, the next Friends for No, I'm rooting for you. The next Michael Jackson, the next Tessa Thompson, the next Sean Carter, the next Neil deGrasse Tyson, I'm rooting for you to be the next you, to be the only damn you, and to make sure that your world will never forget your name. Thank you. I'm Kerry Joy. Thank you.